Hey, welcome to the Bears Connection. I'm glad you're with me today. Uh, we're in Psalm 83. We've been talking about how upset Asaph has been in uh, just knowing that there's a 10-nation confederation that's, um, you know, working against him and uh, coming not just against him, but coming against the entire nation of Israel. And uh, they haven't heard from God. God has been totally quiet on the subject. He hasn't given them given them any, you know, information or encouragement and Asaph is just beside himself and he knows that Israel you know could not fend off this powerful alliance of armies on their own strength so he turned to God and was seeking God for help and he fervently prayed to God you know that God too would miraculously deliver his beloved people one more time look at verse 9 deal with them as with Midian as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook Kishon. Verse 10, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth. So Ahab was recalling how God had mightily, mightily delivered his, his people from their enemies in the past. He was looking back at the time of the judges when God empowered Gideon. Gideon was just a, a coward. He didn't know anything what was going on. And and God called Gideon and strengthened him to defeat the Midianites. And he used Deborah to overthrow the Canaanite kings, uh, Sisera and Jabin. Endor was, was near Tanakh where Deborah and, and Barak defeated the kings of Canaan. And just reminding, you know, God of all these things like, you know, like God had forgot or something. But maybe Asaph needed to remind himself. Maybe he needed to remember and there are times I'm, I'm reminding scriptures of God, but it's not for him. He wrote them. It's for me to remember, you know. Verse 11, make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb. Yes, all their princes like Zeba and Zamuna. So the psalmist, you know, prayed that God would, would, would make the leaders of, of this alliance like Oreb and, and Zin, military leaders of the Midianites and, and Zeba and Zamuna, the the kings of Midian, who were all defeated, you know, in times past. Verse 12, who said, let us take our, uh, uh, for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession? So God defeated these, these uh, greedy, arrogant fools because they had brashly attacked his houses, his pasture land, his promised land. And in like fashion, the leaders of this confederacy were rising up against God and all that belonged to him. It wasn't just against the people, but they were coming against God and everything that was against him. So Asaph was just giving it to God, trying to, to, to get some, something going on here. In verse 13, oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind. So God's people desperately needed his deliverance once again. They weren't going to make it without God intervening. Intervening, There was no hope at all, no chance that that would happen. And Asaph is praying that God would, would scatter his enemies like a, a wheel and like the stubble of chaff blown away by the wind. And the, the Hebrew word for wheel is also used in the Old Testament of an object that is uh, not worth much and real, real light and rolled about by a whirlwind. And a whirlwind comes and just these things just swirl around. They have no weight of their own. Verse 14, as the fire burns the woods and as the flame sets the mountains on fire. So along with his appeal of deliverance, the psalmist asked God to consume his enemies just as a fire destroys the woods or forest and spreads across the mountains, setting them ablaze. He prayed that God would, would persecute uh, pursue, chase, run after. That word could mean all of those things. You know, them like a tempest or like a whirlwind where they would have no strength and they would just run in circles. Picture a terror, this is what they were at, this is what Asaph was asking for. Picture a terrified man running desperately from a tornado with every ounce of energy he has only to be overtaken by this tornado. Verse 15, so pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. So Asaph, Asaph prayed that, that God would overthrow and terrify these demonically influenced enemies in the same way. 
you know, let's just think about that for a moment. Let's just work with that a bit for us, you know? Spiritual powers or forces um, are stronger than we are. This means that we cannot defeat them on our own strength or, our, or by our own devices. Only God can overpower the spiritual forces that, that, that come against us. The Lord alone can deliver us from these the, the, their, their evil clutches. We need to understand this before we pray. And we need to pray accordingly, you know, by asking for God's powerful deliverance when we're feeling that way. Spiritual battles are won with spiritual weapons. You know, and it's it's not that we fight spiritual things, you know, in a, in a carnal way. We don't duke it out with them. We don't do any of those things. We can't verbally beat, you know, the enemy of our souls. And, and we... we, we we need to understand that um, our spiritual weapons are two things. They're the word of God and prayer. And we need to come to the understanding and the truth and live this, man, that our God, the God that we serve, can do anything. Nothing is too hard for him. And as we pray, what happens is we we unleash his power and angelic forces to deliver us from the enemy. I said angelic forces. I believe we have angels all around us. I believe that, man. And I think there are times they protect us over and over and over again. And um, I think sometimes we're going to maybe get to heaven and see some of our angels all beat up and on crutches because we weren't too careful. I don't know. Acts 12, 11 says this. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Back to verse 16 of our Psalm 83. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Now that's an, that's an interesting verse. We haven't heard anything like that yet. The psalmist prayed not only for his enemies to feed, but also for God's glory to prevail. He asked God to use the shame of the enemies and that shame would, would, would that, that defeat, of, the shame of that defeat, I'm sorry, I'll get it out. The shame of that defeat would stir them for good. It would stir these people to seek his name. Specifically, he prayed that others would seek the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the one true God who keeps his promise to his people. The, the psalmist then prayed that the people of all nations would see how God rescued his people and, and they would believe in him. The verses that follow, verses 17 and 18, kind of further express this, this request that Asaph is making. Look at verse 17. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and to perish those who refuse to submit to God, that they would be shamed and perished forever. That's what he's saying. Israel's enemies were obstinate unbelievers who refused to even consider their God. Therefore, Asaph prayed for their disgrace and destruction. The second statement of this verse is a restatement of the first, emphasizing the fervency of, of his request. He prayed that they would be confounded or put to shame and they would be troubled or perish forever. Now, in the verses before that, he was talking about some of them would respond and, and, and seek God's, God's name. But I think here he's talking about those who would not, those who would not respond to God's name. Verse 18, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Asaph elaborated on his request for people to seek the Lord for his destruction of Israel's enemies. He prayed that people would know that he, Jehovah God, is the most high, Elyon, over all the earth. He further asked that they would truly turn to him and, and become genuine believers who glorify and, and really honor his name. Let's think about that for a second, okay? 
We serve a God who brings good out of evil. We serve a God who uses our afflictions to help others. And I can't help but thinking of the story of Joseph. What a mighty man of God Joseph was. Sold into slavery by his brothers, his own brothers. Then he was lied about thrown into prison for something he hadn't done. And when he finally gets out of prison and he ends up a blessing from God, he becomes the prime minister of all of, of, all of Egypt because of his ability to, you know, interpret uh, Pharaoh's dream and know exactly what God was saying about a coming famine. Well, Famine got so bad that his dad sent his brothers to get help from Egypt. Well, they went through some stuff. He kind of played with them a little bit and sent them back and forth. And but then in verse fifty, they he reveals to them who he is. Hey, I'm your I'm your brother Joseph. And the fear struck them, and they felt that he's going to get even now. He's going to get back at us. For all that we did, we sold him into slavery and we don't know the rest of his story. But look at this. He's the chief guy here and he could have them do anything to us. We're history. Then Joseph looked at them and said, hey, I'm paraphrasing here. But he said, hey, listen to me. Chapter 50 of the book of Genesis, verse 20. He said, what you meant for evil, God has caused for good. And if he could do that in that situation, he can do that in any situation. He could take that thing in your life right now, my friend, that thing that you think there's 10 nations of armies coming against you. What's happening is so powerful. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's a disease. Maybe it's a loss of a loved one. Maybe it's a financial thing. Maybe it's a job loss. Maybe it's a family situation that you can't see being corrected. And, and the list goes on and on and on. And, and you just don't know what to do. I'm here to tell you that what was meant for evil, God can cause for good. Romans 8, 28 still says it too, man. For God causes all things. He doesn't cause all things. It doesn't stop there. For God causes all things to work together for good to them that love him and are the called according to his purpose. So receive that. Whatever's going on in your life right now, as you feel this this confederacy coming at you and the enemy is on you and you don't know what to do. Trust God. Because as we seek his deliverance, we should pray for the salvation of others and for God to be glorified. And man, I say that and I wish I could sit here and tell you I'm a man that always does that. You know, when somebody does me wrong, I say, oh God, bless them abundantly. But I'm learning. I'm really learning. I'm doing a lot more now than I used to. I'm learning to, to walk in what God says no matter how I feel. You know, if they've done me bad or done me wrong or messed around, whatever, I'm just gonna, I, I wanna pray and say, God bless them, use them <laughs> mightily in, in your kingdom. We need to see the crisis in our lives and the enemy attacks, attacks against us as opportunity for God to use them, to expand his kingdom, for people to get saved, for lives to be touched, for people to be reconciled, and the list can go on and on and on. We need to live to the praise of his glory. What in the world does that mean? That means we need to live in such a way that people can see us and they're going to praise him and know that God's real. What an opportunity. When we are suffering, we have the opportunity to, for God's glory to prevail. We have an opportunity to let our light shine that others may see God in us and glorify him. We should respond to crisis in such a way that the, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ is able to shine through us. And for this to occur, we have to live in faith. 
trusting God in all things, God's glory should, should be our first priority. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, I just, I just want to tell you, as I sit here and say these things to you and share these things with you, I want you to know that I'm not somebody that says for the last 50 years of ministry, I have walked in all of these things perfectly and you need to walk in them too. I'm telling you that I'm learning some of this stuff fresh. I've taught it before, I've walked in it before, but there's something There's something that every time you read the word, you, you see new stuff, you, need, you see ways that it needs to be applied. And I realized that um, I didn't always pray the way I, I should have prayed. I wasn't always, you know, I, I prayed for people the whole, my whole ministry, my whole life, you know, and I've watched God do some wonderful things. I've prayed and covered my family and my, my wife was the greatest anybody could ever have and my kids are serving the Lord and that's all wonderful, but you know what? Could have done better. Could have done better. Could have prayed harder. Could have been nicer. Could have sought God more. And that's all I'm saying, that none of us have arrived. You know, I'm, I was talking to one of my daughters yesterday, I think, and I, I told her, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to find a place. I'm, I'm not sure I'm totally there, but I'm beginning to find a place where I'm satisfied. And I'm not talking about life. I'm talking about I'm satisfied with my relationship with Jesus. I'm satisfied that that's enough. That's all I need. I don't need anything else. I don't need pats on the back. I don't need, you know, to write a big book so everybody could read it. I don't need to build a bigger church. I don't, and I'm coming against any of those things. I'm just saying that I've come to the place where I don't, I don't need anything except my relationship with him. And I'm being secure in that. And I'm, you know, the Bible says that godliness with contentment is great gain. And I want to be content. Whatever my life is, whatever's going on, however deeply I miss my, my bride so, so much sometimes. And no matter what the enemy throws at me in, in fears or, or financial or mainly physical in my life, what he throws at me and I'm, 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 I'm satisfied. I'm content. Whatever God wants to let happen in my life, I'm content with him. And that's, that's all I need to know that I'm walking with him. And, and it hasn't always been that way. But I'm praying that you maybe can see it sooner than I can, that all of us, is all we need is to be content in him and trust him and walk with him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other stuff is going to be added unto you. That's what he said. He promised that. We seek him first in his righteousness. What is his righteousness? His kingdom, his righteousness, living right, living according to the word, reading the word and saying, how does this apply to my life? Doing that, we can learn to be the men and women that God has created us to be. Well, Father, I, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for this this psalm that means so much to me. I want to be a man of prayer more than I've ever been. I want to seek you in such a way that I'm just not praying for deliverance. I'm praying for the other people, the people around, maybe the people that caused my consternation at the time or whatever, Lord. I just want to learn how you want me to live. Change me every day, Lord. I want to finish well. I want to finish more on my knees than on my feet. Lord, I'm just, that's a challenge to me. That's not bragging, that's nothing. That's just, that's my, that's what I would like. Whether I'm able to do it or not, I don't know. But I'm sure gonna try because I want a fellowship with you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for this time together. We love you so much. Okay, guys, we'll uh, see you tomorrow, I hope. All right, God bless you.